In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Bible study tonight from Psalm 89. The title of this psalm, A Contemplation of Ethan the Israelite. There are some different opinions on who is Ethan, to whom this psalm is ascribed. There are several men named Ethan in the scripture. But some believe he is this man that's mentioned specifically in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 31. And he was one of three singers, he man, Asaph, and Ethan. And he was called Israelite because he was from the family of Zerah. Ethan shared with Haman a reputation of wisdom. They were wise people and was mentioned as someone who was famous for his wisdom, yet surpassed by Solomon's greater wisdom. So he was the second after Solomon. This means he was likely a contemporary of Solomon and was alive also during the reign of David. This psalm actually is about the kingdom of David from a human perspective. When Ethan started to see the split that happened after King Solomon during the time of Rehoboam, he was concerned about this kingdom, especially God promised David that his seed will remain on the throne forever. Of course, Ethan understood it in a literal way, but the seed, as we'll explain today, the seed was the Messiah whose kingdom shall have no end. So that's why many believe that this Ethan is the one who lived during Solomon and Rehoboam because when he saw the decline of David's family and the revolt of the ten tribes from it, he started to be worried and disappointed because God promised David that his kingdom will remain forever. But others say that he was perhaps one of this name who lived at the time of the Babylonian captivity. And when he saw the low state that David's family were come into, that's why he composed this psalm. This group say that in order to comfort the people of God when they saw the captivity and the decline of David's family, he wrote this psalm showing that the covenant and the promises of God that he made with David firm and will be accomplished. It is uncertain when it was written, but if it's written by someone during captivity, then it is written during the 70 years of captivity. And as you know, the book of Psalms was divided into four books. So this Psalm 89 is considered the last psalm of the third book of the Psalms from 73 by Asaph to 89. Many psalms actually started with a complaint and prayer but ended with joy. But this psalm actually starts with joy and praise and end with sad complaint and petition. So this psalm in this composition was the opposite of many other psalms. The psalmist first described God's previous mercies, and then he described the present tribulation with intensity. He asked the Lord to fulfill his promises that he declared that he made to David his servant, and to remember what rebukes his servant bore from the ungodly. So he said, your servants bore many rebukes from the ungodly, so remember your covenant, remember your mercies, remember your promises, and restore the power of David's family. The psalm is based on the covenant by which the Lord through the prophet Nathan proclaimed to David. When prophet Nathan said to David, your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. But as I told you, Ethan the composer of this psalm understood it in an earthly way. But this prophecy is fulfilled in the Messiah, because the Messiah is the son of David. So this divine promise 
carries a clear prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ of the seed of David who will reign in his church forever. As we say in the creed, his kingdom shall have no end. Also in this psalm, we will see a prophecy about the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ and the suffering of his church, who has a complete trust in the steadfast love of God and his faithfulness in his promises and his covenant with his people. Many passages in this psalm, as we'll explain, are applied to the Messiah by Jewish writers, especially verse 20, was quoted in Acts 13.22 I have found my servant David with my holy oil I have anointed him. This verse was quoted in Acts 13.22 The psalm was most probably written at a time when the people were going through such affliction to assume that God has forgotten his covenant and his promises. The psalm is 52 verses, from verse 1 to 7, praising God, as I told you, it started with a joyful tune, from 8 to 18, trusting in God's faithfulness, from 19 to 37, God promises and covenant to David, then from 38 to 52, lament and call for renewal. As I told you, it ends with a complaint and lamentation. Tonight we'll study only till verse 18, from 1 to 18. Verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. So the past loving kindness of God are unchangeable facts. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His faithfulness to his promises is beyond the question. That's why in the opening verses, the psalmist faith rises triumphantly over the circumstances in which he is situated. Whether when he saw the decline and the spread of the kingdom during the time of Rahabam, or whether during captivity, but you can see from verse 1, his faith in God was strong. And he states his theme, the loving kindness and the faithfulness of God can never fail, never fail. Yes, the psalmist has a very sad complaint to make of the awful condition of the family of David at this time. Yet, he begins the psalm with songs of praise. That's what the church teaches us, even during the time of funeral or any difficult time, we start with giving thanks to God. We give him thanks in every condition. The psalmist will commemorate God's mercy, not only when they are continuing, but forever always. As he said, I will sing the mercies of the Lord forever. Forever can be applied to the singing, which means I will sing forever the mercies of the Lord. Or forever can be applied to the mercies. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord that last forever. So forever can be applied, either refer to the mercies of God or to the singing, both. And this is a psalm with a lot of trouble, but the presence of trouble did not silence the psalmist's praise. So he's sing, singing to God and praising him even in the time of trouble. He does not say the mercy of the Lord in a singular way, but he said mercies. For according to the multitude of our misery, the mercies of the Lord abound and multiply. As the psalmist said in another place, when my worries or my anxieties increase in my heart. Your comforts delight my soul. So when our miseries increase or multiply, the mercies of the Lord also will be multiplied. Because God's mercies are infinite and His truth 
is sacred and firm. And this must be the matter of our joy and praise. That's why he said, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. We must sing of God's mercies as long as we live. Because his mercies upon us is new every morning, as we say in the Lamentation of Jeremiah chapter 3. The second part of the first verse is a repetition of an explanation of the first part of the verse. When he said, to all generation, that's forever. When he said, I will sing, it is the same like I make known. And the mercies of the Lord seem to have the same meaning, faithfulness. So it is a repetition of the first part, but paraphrasing the word. Forever and to all generation carry the meaning that this psalm would be sung by the faithful to the end of time. So until now we chant this psalm. Ethan not only experienced the mercies and faithfulness of God, he also wants to make them known to others. To tell others about the mercies and faithfulness of God. More importantly, he wanted to spread the glory and fame of God as broadly as possible. St. Jerome says, The psalmist did not start by the faithfulness, then reach to the mercies. But having his sins forgiven, this the mercies, he got the mercies first, then reach to the faithfulness. This was for their benefit that they might also experience God's faithfulness and mercy. So when he declared to the people the mercies of God, he forgave our sins, then they will speak about the faithfulness because God was faithful to his promises. He promised to forgive our sins and to have mercy upon us. That's why he is declaring also his faithfulness to all generations. St. Augustine said the word Ethan means strong. So St. Augustine says, He himself is meant, God himself is meant. In my belief, St. Augustine says, By the understanding of Ethan the Israelite, which has given this psalm its title, you see then who is meant by Ethan. Who is Ethan? But the meaning of the word is strong. And no one in this world is strong except in the hope of God's promises. For as to our own deserving, we are weak. We are weak. But in his mercy, we are strong. Weak then in himself, but strong in God's mercy. The psalmist thus begins, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Verse 2, For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness shall establish in the very heavens. For I have said, means he had firmly believed and had reflectively come to this conclusion. So the psalmist in verse 2 introduces the motive for his psalm. He is persuaded that the mercies of the Lord is established. One stone after another will continue to be laid in the building of God's loving kindness till it reaches the heaven itself. But let me explain. This doesn't mean the mercies of God is growing. No. But the revelation of the mercies of God to us is growing. So, how God manifests and reveals his mercy to us, that's our perception. From our perception, as if the mercies of God are built one stone above the other. But the mercies of God is complete in itself. He noted the permanent, enduring character of God's mercy and faithfulness. And how God has established these things is forever in heaven. As the goodness of God's nature is to be the matter of our song, so much more the mercy that is built for us in the covenant. So God is good, 
and his mercies endures forever, as we say in the second verse of the Tasbih. And the mercies of God is still increasing, increasing from our perception, increasing in its revelation to us, increasing in its manifestation to us, not growing from God's perspective. It's like house in the building up and shall continue forever like a house built up. And in the first part he said mercy shall be built forever. And because mercy will be built forever, your faithfulness will establish in very heaven. Because faithfulness, God promised us that he will have mercy upon us. So when we see his mercies are built forever, then we know his faithfulness is established in heaven. So mercy shall be built up forever because your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heaven. God's promises are unchangeable. They are established in the very heavens and they are above the changes of these earths. The earth is changeable. Heaven is not. The heaven cannot be touched. They cannot be changed. So the psalmist is saying that he was assured of the mercies of God and he had strongly concluded from the Holy Spirit and from the word of God and therefore he spoke it having it from God. God who cannot speak untruth, God is faithful. Having said so, that's why he will think of his truth and mercy, which will be everlasting. The mercifully promised to David will rise up like an everlasting building in heaven. So that's why he is quoting what God said to David in verse 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. So he is sending a comfort message to the people. Even if you see the declining of the kingdom of David, but God who is faithful, God who is merciful, he made a covenant with David. He has sworn to David. So God is faithful to fulfill this promise and this covenant. So this promise is firm and stable as an immovable building reaches to heaven. No time can damage, no time can shake this immovable building. That's why it will be established in the very heavens, heavens where everything is eternal, not temporal. For the event will not depend on thoughts of mortal, nor on changeable counsels of the earth, but will have its foundation in heaven. That's why he praised God for the promise of eternal dominion of the house of David. God's promise to David is the entire foundation of the, the psalmist hope and confidence. That's why he places very clearly in verse 3, the appointment of David to the throne was an act of mere mercy and favor from God. Because David was not from the royal line. He was not from the descendant of Benjamin, a son of Saul. He had no claim to the crown. So the covenant with David and the promise therein made to him and was intended actually not to the earthly kingdom of David, but to the Messiah, because he descended from the seed of David. That's why there is a higher reason of celebrating the mercies of God, because this promise is given for the Messiah, the Savior of the whole world. God promised David, I will set up your seed after you. And I want you to notice the word seed is singular, not plural. I will come back to this who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. This promise was partially fulfilled in Solomon, the direct son of David and the immediate heir to the throne. But it is most perfectly fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David. These prophecies cannot possibly apply to a temporal kingdom, to an earthly kingdom, because any earthly kingdom will 
end one day, like kingdom of David, right now, we have no trace for this kingdom. But this promises for a spiritual and eternal kingdom. And St. Paul noticed that God, when he made the promise, he said, in your seed, singular, not in your seeds. St. Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, he said, he doesn't say your seeds, plural, but says your seed in the singular, as said by the apostle, now to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made. He does not say, and to the seeds as of many, but as of one, to your seed who is Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Saint Jerome comments on and built up your throne to all generations. In verse 4, your seed again, your seed, not your seeds. I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Silam. So Saint Jerome said, the throne of God is built, as we already said, on two generations. The Gentiles, the uncircumcised, and the Jews, the circumcised. Your throne to all generation, this shows that the passage is not to be understood literally, temporal kingdom of David, but because no kingdom, including the kingdom of David, did not last many generations. But again, we understand it on a spiritual throne and kingdom of Messiah, whose throne is forever and ever, and whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, as Archangel Gabriel said to St. Mary in the Annunciation. His throne is in heaven, where he will reign until all the enemies are put under his feet, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Then Sila at the end of verse 4, Sila is a pause for contemplation. So, so Ethan believed that the wonderful mercies and faithfulness of God in such a promise was worthy of emphasis and meditation. So he instructed the musical pause, Selam. It's a pause for contemplation and reflection. Verse 5. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. Having repeated the divine promise to David about the Messiah, the psalmist appeals to nature, heaven, and history, as we will see, to confirm his conviction of the enduring character of the truth and grace of God. The heavens are witness of it, as we read in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Who are the assembly of the saints? In verse 5, many commentators said that's the angelic being. As if the sun brought together all creation, all together to recognize the greatness and majesty of God. But Saint Jerome, Saint Augustine, and scholar Origen believe that the assembly of the saints are the believers, the church of God, who became new heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we are testifying to the wonders of God in us. We conquer the death in Christ Jesus. So, the same angels who surround the throne of God in thousands of thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand will praise and glorify the mercies and the truth of God. They know the extent of that mercy that's built up forever in the heavens, better than people who lie humbly on earth. That's why he said, the heaven, praise your wonders, O Lord, and your faithfulness in the assembly of the saints. Sometimes here on earth, we have our weaknesses, but in heaven, they, they surround the, the throne of God, so they know the mercies and the truth of God. As if the psalmist is saying that we here on earth, because we are tied and bound with the chains of our sin, we are weak through our mortal imperfection, we cannot praise God correctly. 
But the host of engines will do what we cannot do. In one of the fraction, the fraction that start only begotten son, Ayuhan ibn al-Wahid al-Ilahi kalma, we say, I thank you, O Lord, and all the ranks of the angels thank you on my behalf, because I cannot thank you as befitting your wonders. Ashkurak ya ilahi wa tashkurak anni malaikatak wa khaliqatak jami'an la'anni aajizun an hamdak kama yasthaq hubbak fahar ra'ayna hubban a'azam min hazi. So, because we are imperfect and we cannot praise God correctly, that is why the host of angels do what we cannot do. Don't the heavenly praise the wonders of God when a choir of the angels descended from heaven during the time of the birth of Christ and said, Glory to God in the highest peace on earth, goodwill toward men? Also, how many times the heavens bore witness to the Lord Jesus Christ? A star guided the wise men to the place of birth. The heavens were opened during the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ and voice of God the Father was heard. The sun was darkened during the time of crucifixion. An angel came from heaven and sat on the empty tomb to declare the resurrection of God. Verse 6 For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord. God's angels praise him and only him. Why? Because there is none in heaven or in earth can be compared to him. God's greatness means he is incomparable. Those who in heavens are all servant, subject to him, which he repeats by asking, who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to God? None. So, understanding the incomparability of God in His holiness, in His might, in His greatness, this should bring forth a sense of awe and praise from us, His people. Especially when we meet together and we feel the incomparable holiness and greatness of God. For who in the heavens can be compared to her, the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. So when we gather together, we need actually to fear God, to show reverence. That's why the deacon several times say, worship God in fear and trembling. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those who are around him. Nature teaches us that God should be approached with awe, with respect, with reverence, and all the teaching of revelation confirms this. His power is to be feared. His justice is to be feared. His holiness is to be feared. And there is much also in his goodness, his benevolences, his mercy to fill our mind with reference. God to be feared in the assembly of the saints. So either when we meet together as worshippers or among the heavenly ranks. So wherever and whenever in this world or in heaven, there should be deep sincerity and reverence by all the created being. And we need to remember this when we assemble in the church during the divine liturgy, during Vesper, during midnight praises, the church of God, where we meet and assemble together, God is to be feared in the assembly of the saints. Verse 8, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. So the psalmist in this passage will confirm that not only God is incomparable in heaven, but he is the only and exalted one 
in nature and in history. His authority over nature and his authority in the history. No one who in respect to power could be compared to God. He is the Almighty. And the reason why nobody is perfectly like him, because God is all-powerful, able to do not one thing, but to do everything in the same time. And nothing can resist his power. And this expression, his faithfulness surround you, means he is not only able to do all things, but actually he will do what he promises. And he is faithful in his promises. Sometimes here, in a relative way, maybe a person has power. And he can do all many things, actually. But he is not faithful in his promises. He might promise, and although it is in his hand to do it, but he is unfaithful. But God actually, number one, he can do all things. And no one can resist him. And number two, he is faithful. If he promises, he will fulfill his promise. And when he said, your, your faithfulness surround you, because he has it perfectly of himself as his attribute, he is not deriving it from another source. If we are faithful, we get his faithfulness from God. But God in himself is faithful. He is the faithfulness. He is the faithfulness. So faithfulness clothes God as a garment. As Isaiah said in chapter 11, verse 5, Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins. Faithfulness the belt of his waist. The belt binds all the garments together around the body. So the truth of Christ, the faithfulness of Christ, bind the word of his promises together. So his promises cannot be changed. They must be fulfilled. Start speaking about his power over nature. In verse 9 he said, You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Having said that God was both powerful and faithful, now he proves that by facts from history how he rules over the sea and how he calmed its waves. So when the sea is raging and stormy, when it seems as if everything would be swept away before it, God has absolute control over it. He remembered what God did to the Red Sea, how he divided the water, and the water stood up like a wall on each side, and the children of Israel passed through it. And he said, when its waves rise, you tell them, God can make the waves still and quiet. I'm sure you remember the story when they were in the boat, and there was a great storm, and the Lord Jesus Christ rebuked the wind, and restrained the raging sea, and made it calm, when the ship in which he was with the disciples was covered with waves. Verse 10, you have broken Raha in pieces, as one who is slain, you have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. Rahab is Egypt. So it is taken as personification of the proud and strong Egypt. As we read in Psalm 87, I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon. So Rahab was broken in pieces, means was crushed, was defeated. As one who is slain and expresses the result, this merciless giant, Egypt, now lies in pieces, harmless, cannot harm the children of God. So verse 10 points to the destruction of the Egyptian when Pharaoh and his people were broken to pieces by the ten plagues and also when the firstborn was slain, and when they crossed the Red Sea, and they were drowned, Pharaoh and his horses in the Red Sea, and were seen by the Israelites on the shore, all dead men. So, in spiritual way, 
Rahab symbolizes Satan. So this a symbol of the Lord breaking in pieces the proud one, Satan. And he's breaking his head, destroying his words, spoiling his principalities and powers. Because Satan is often represented as dragon or serpent, and that king uncrushed his head. And according to St. Augustine, we should understand that the devil is wounded, and not by stabbing the body, because he doesn't have a body, but by stabbing the pride of Satan, pride of his heart. St. Jerome also said, Rahab here is the devil who had already wounded, who had deadly wound by the nails of the cross. So by the nails of the cross, Satan was deadly wounded. You have scattered your enemy with your mighty arm. You have scattered your enemy with your mighty arm. So the son now explains that it is no wonder that God so easily calmed the sea, humbled the proud one, because he is the Lord of all, and that by reason of his having created everything, he is the creator of everything, then he has power of everything. That's why in verse 11 he said, Heavens are yours, earth also is yours. You created heaven and earth. The world and all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. The world and the west, and Hermon on the east rejoices in your name. So the fullness of the entire world, north and south, all belong to God. He is the absolute owner of the world and everything in it because he is the creator. Heavens are work of his hand and the throne of his glory. The angels in heaven are his creatures and his servants. The north and south, Actually, it is assertion of God's creative and governing power over the four quarters of the earth. Because he said, North, South, and Tabur, and Harbon is East and West. So the North is symbol of evil. Why? As we read in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 14, Then the Lord said to me, Out of the North calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. And actually, it was a literal fact. The empire of Assyria and that of Babylon, north to Israel, and both by Assyria and Babylon, Israel suffered a lot from them, and both of them are north to the Holy Land. Also, the north wind is cold, and he, north is a symbol of Satan or Antichrist, lacking the fire of the divine love. And Tabor and Harmon represent west and east. Because Tabor is the mountain on the west part of Galilee, in the tribe of the Bolon. And the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ happened in the mountain Tabor. Harmon is the mountain called by the Sidonians Syrian, and by the Amorites called Sinium and was in the east, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 8 to 9. And at that time, we took the land from the hand of the two kings of the Amorites, who were on this side of the Jordan, from river Arnon to Mount Harmon. The Sidonians call Harmon Syrian, and the Amorites call it Sinir. So, Harmon on the east and Tabor on the west, and he said the north and the south. So God has control over the whole world. Both mountains had full right to rejoice in his name. And he said, Tabor and Harmon rejoice in your name. Why? Tabor, according to St. Augustine, means coming light. So who is the coming light? Jesus. He is the true light that comes into the world. And Harmon means his cursing, implies the overthrow and punishment of Satan as a result of the coming of this light. That's why Tabor and Harmon rejoices in his name. Also, other commentators said Tabor represented the Jews, Harmon represents the Gentile. God is able to do everything, for he is the Lord God Almighty. Verse 13, 
You have a mighty arm. Strong is a your hand, and high is your right hand. And the mighty arm was mentioned also in verse 10. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. And verse 13, he elaborated more. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand, and high is your right hand. His arm, his hand is mighty and strong, but God doesn't use power against his people. Many powerful kings or rulers, they use their power to control and to crush their people. But God used his power and his might to save his people, destroy the enemies. None can either resist the force or bear the weight of his mighty hand, his power. The hand is an instrument by which we execute our plans. So God is often represented as having delivered his people with a strong hand, with mighty hand, with strong hand. The skill and strength of men are often expressed in the arm and hand, especially the right hand. So even applied this principle in a metaphor to God, expressing his skill and his strength. Verse 14, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth are go before your face. Righteousness means to do everything right. Justice, to do everything fair. Mercy is to give others what they don't deserve. That's mercy. And truth is like fairness or, or justice. So he is saying here, righteousness and justice are foundation of your throne. He spoke about the might of God, but God used his might rightly. So the psalmist here is speaking from the might to the right. Because some people are mighty, but using their might unrighteously. So God is not merely strong to do whatever he wants, but all that he wills is consonant with right and justice. What he does is the right thing, because the throne of God is founded on justice and right judgment. It is this which supports his throne. And God also exhibits great mercy to all men, how? By teaching them through his law, through his commandments by helping them through grace, by encouraging them to virtue through the promise of reward. So he showed mercy to all. And those who reject the mercies of God, then he showed them his justice. So he proves his justice by rewarding the good who accepted the mercies of God and punishing the wicked who rejected the mercies of God. Because if his mercy had not preceded his justice, we would have been all lost. St. Augustine says, Your righteousness and judgment will appear in the end. They are now hidden. There, in the end, will then be a manifestation of your righteousness and judgment. How? Some will be set on the right, others on the left. The unbelieving will tremble when they see what now they mocked before and they did not believe. But the righteous will rejoice when they shall see what they now see not, we don't see it now, but we believe. Then he said, mercy and truth go before your face means mercy and truth are his companions wherever he goes. All his ways are mercy and truth. Mercy in forgiving our sins saving the sinners that come to the Father through Christ, and truth in completing and achieving all his purposes, all his promises, all his covenant. Verse 15. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. After he explained the union of God's power and truth with his mercy, Power, truth, mercy. The psalmist applied them to the people of Israel, or the believers, 
when we experience God's power in saving us, mercy in forgiving us, justice in rewarding us. So those who know the joyful sound of this truth and his incomparable might and his righteousness and justice and his mercy and truth are blessed people. Blessed are the, are the people who know the joyful sound Joyful sound of what? Of his truth, his mind, and his mirth. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. Truly they are blessed beyond all others, are the people of God who know and experience in practice the truth of the mind and the mercies, and they praise him. They are blessed because they don't walk in darkness. Those who experience the truth, the mercy, and the mind, they are walking in light. Those who did not experience, they are walking in darkness. But we who are walking in the light of His countenance. We enjoy the gracious presence of God, favor, and fellowship of His face, light of your countenance. So the psalm is saying that to inspire the godly people with hope and with confidence we rely on God, and not to be discouraged by any adversities or hardship or any difficult situation. Although all men, wicked and righteous, are sustained and nourished by his liberality, God shine his sun on the wicked and on the godly. But who is feeling, who experienced the paternal goodness of God, only the righteous? The paternal goodness of God is far from being experienced by the ungodly. That's why a singular privilege which he bestows upon his true believer to make them taste of his goodness, thereby they may be encouraged to be glad and rejoice. That's why in verse 16 he said, In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. When they reflect on the righteousness of God, they will be happy, they rejoice. So the true happiness is based on experiencing the divine goodness. When the divine goodness fills our heart, we will rejoice and will stir us up to praise Him and to thank Him. They not only enjoy the benefits of God, but also they pass the whole course of their life in mental peace and tranquility. This is the meaning of walking in the light of God's countenance. And the greatest of what they enjoy is not to get temporal blessing, money, no. But they enjoy the light of God's countenance to walk the journey of their life in this indescribable glorious joy. And they need nothing with you, O God. I don't need anything on earth. Because in your name, they rejoice all day long, the name of God. The name of God means His presence. And His presence is the secret of the exaltation, our exaltation all day long. God's revelation of Himself is the source and the subject of our joy. His unwavering adherence to His covenant, His faithfulness in fulfilling His covenant is the secret of our prosperity. They rejoice all day long in the name. In the name means in your character, in the nature of God. Nature that's incomparable. It is their privilege and it is their duty to rejoice always. Because God always the same yesterday, today and forever. That's why the happiness which is found in His being an attribute at one time we can find it all the time. His promises are the same, and His people will find happiness in His promises always, even during the time of difficulty. There is no reason why the people of God should not be constantly happy, even in the midst of tribulation, because we rely on His promises. That's why we are always happy. Those who have such a God and such hope, they should be happy all the time. Verse 17 
for you are the glory of their strength and in your favor our horn is exalted in verse 17 he is saying this to humble the pride of people prideful people assume to themselves what belongs to God that's why they will lose it because whatever power and strength we have is from God and from not from ourselves therefore it is in God not in ourselves we should glory you are the glory of their strength and in your favor our horn our power is exalted so God does this he gave us this power not because we deserve it but because he is merciful he is gracious he wants to give us his power so their strength or our strength drives its honor and glory not from anything in ourselves not from anything we accomplish but from the fact it's derived from God and the horn is a symbol of power so their power had been derived from God or that all which contributed to their exaltation and honor in the world had been derived from God and God's favor toward his people exalted them among the nation verse 18 which is the last verse in our Bible tonight for our shield belongs to the Lord and our king belongs to the Holy One of Israel our king to the Holy One of Israel means the king of Israel belongs to God why? because he is appointed by God to be the representative of God that's why he's titled the anointed of God so he derives his authority from God therefore can claim his protection from God so those who protect us like the kings and rulers they themselves are protected by God they had no other defense nothing else can depend on except God God does not only give us the strength to defeat the devil but he is our shield as he said our shield belongs to the Lord he is our shield he is our king and he is our savior so God is our defense from all our enemies being all around us God is like a wall of fire to protect us those who are in my hand no one can touch them as the mountains were around Jerusalem and being kept by the power as a fortress stronghold and he said the king belonged to the Holy One of Israel the word Holy One of Israel repeated frequently especially in the book of Isaiah and it denotes that God in his character he is a holy God and he entered into a covenant with his people and his holiness is pledged to redeem his people and wants us to be holy like him this actually concludes our Bible study tonight glory be to God forever and ever Amen